Thank you very much. I'm really very happy, honored to celebrate here uh, the Abel Prize uh, of Yves Meyer. Yves Meyer had uh, an absolutely considerable impact on several generations of uh, young French mathematicians. Of course, his uh, 50 students, but well beyond. Well beyond. I personally belong to this beyond set. And I've been very much influenced by his vision, his warmth, and his way to practice and travel across uh, the different fields. His enthusiasm for uh, new ideas and the way he mixes both creativity but a remarkable technical agility and this curiosity that we spoke about a lot which let him go from number theory, pure harmonic analysis, applied mathematics. For us, it was absolutely amazing. It was showing that one can cross frontiers completely freely, and many of us did that following his own path. So what today I'm going to talk about is this wavelet story, and this wavelet story is interesting because You'll have as many stories as number of people who will be speaking about it. I'm sure uh, Ingrid and Emmanuel will give different point of views. The point of view I'll be giving here is from scale, looking at the world from a multi-scale uh, point of view. If you think about it, uh, whole physics is organized around the idea of scale at the very small scale of 10 to the minus 15 uh, meters, you have particle quantum physics, interactions of particles, and as you grow up progressively, you have structures of atoms, molecular dynamics. Uh, you go from one field to the, to the next, which divides a uh, scale like that, quantum mechanics, material science. And as you grow progressively, you see appearing other type of phenomena which are characteristic of continuous physics. And then obviously, uh, Eve spoke about uh, gravitational waves. That's the scale of universe astronomy, which is about of 10 to the 20 meters. Now, it's very important to separate these scale phenomena because you have different properties which are emerging at each of these scales, and at the same time, interactions of scale are extremely important in the sense that properties of galaxies also depend upon property of quantum mechanics. And wavelets is a kind of zoom, as we'll see, which allows us to travel across all these scales and understand their properties. Now, when you sense the world, you sense the world, you get measurements and signals. And when you look at the signals, whether it's a financial series, seismic signals, which reveals the underground, or even turbulence, very often you have a lot of structures against at different scales, which reveals these very complex world. You have structures at very short time, much bigger time, that's true for such signals, but we've heard a lot of music uh, yesterday, and... Oops, we don't hear the music, but... I won't sing, don't worry, that would be much worse. But if you look at music, you have the scale of the musical notes, you have the scale of measures, and then you have musical phrase, and then you have whole pieces, and at each of these scales there are different elements which are coming in. That's going to also be true for images. If you look at an image like that, you can look at the large structure where you see a woman looking at you, you can look at details, the hat, you can zoom into the face, the eyes, and so on, and it's all these structures which allows to have a global perception. So, this also comes in very naturally, of course, in signal processing, and we'll see how these both fields will exchange and, in some sense, uh, share very important mathematical tools. Now, Eve began with the Fourier transform. Let me come back to this Fourier transform, which is, of course, the basic tool that has been used since 
1820 to describe and understand the property of time series. So the idea of the Fourier transform is that any function of time can be described as a sum of sine waves, which is specified by the fact that sinusoidal waves define an orthogonal basis of the space of functions having a finite energy. So that means the fact that it's a basis, of course, is that you can decompose your function as a linear combination of these different sine waves with coefficients. And the beauty of an orthogonal basis is that the coefficients, you simply compute them as an inner product. In other words, by correlating your signal, your function, with your sine waves. So here, for example, you have a regular function, and you'll look at the correlation with the sine wave. Now, the representation you obtain of your function is the set of these Fourier coefficients. Now, one of the very important properties of these coefficients is that it allows you to discover the property of the function. And in particular, the global regularity of the function, you'll be able to find it by looking how, at how fast these Fourier coefficient decays, because a regular function is essentially described by low-frequency sinusoidal waves, whereas the high frequency will describe the irregularities. Now, the problem is, when you have a particular irregularity, of course, it will come out in the Fourier domain through high frequencies, but it will not tell you where is this irregularity. In other words, if you want to describe globally a function, it's perfect. But if you want to know, for example, what I'm saying at that moment and that other moment, you need to localize these properties. And that's the key idea that led many people to try to think how to localize these sine waves. Now, the story has many origins, and I'll begin here the story from the work of Jean Morlet. So Jean Morlet was an engineer working in seismology in an oil company. And the issue here is to send waves in the underground that will be reflected and measured by sensors in order to reveal the property of the underground. And of course, you want to reveal the local property of the underground. So the question is, what kind of wave do you want to sense and to send in the underground? And instead of having a global vibration with Jean Morlet or an explosion, Jean Morlet proposed to send wavelet. So a wavelet is called a wavelet because that's the name of waves that you send in the underground in geophysics. And now, the key idea for the wavelet is that it's going to be a function that oscillates, but you are going to squeeze it. And then, as Yves mentioned, he met Alex Grossman, who had a similar issue coming from quantum physics, where you want to describe properties of function which are localized both in time or space, and Fourier, which are the issue of coherent states that I think Ingrid Dobichy will be speaking about. So the idea is, because your wavelet is local, you need to translate it. So you're going to have a translation parameter, which is going to define the location of the wavelet. And then, because you want to explore all scale, you are going to squeeze the wavelet from very fine scale, very narrow wavelets to a large scale, very large wavelet. And then you do like in the Fourier transform. You take your signal and you correlate it with each of these wavelets, different location, different scale, and that would be the wavelet transform. So, this transform, you can visualize it as an image. You have a function here, and then you look at the correlation of your function with different wavelets, different location, different scale. And at a given scale and given location, you are going to have a correlation, and you have a point in the image. Gray point means the coefficients are zero. White, they are big, positive, black, negative. And what you see in this image is that you have large amplitude coefficients which are zooming into the sharp transition, the singularities of the function. Not surprising, because the wavelets are computing local variations of your function. Now, what Jean Morlet and Alex Grossman realized is that you can reconstruct, in fact, your function from this whole image of wavelet coefficients, similarly to the Fourier series, by multiplying them by the wavelet coefficient and then summing 
over all translations and all scales. And that's where Yves Meyer comes in, by recognizing within this formula the fact that it's the same formula that Calderon used in harmonic analysis when he was working with Zygmunt in Chicago. And that was the bridge between this work in seismology physics and the whole program of Calderon Zygmunt in harmonic analysis. Now, one important question is that we can see large amplitude coefficients are going to be related to some kind of singularities, but you'd like to understand mathematically what's the nature of this relation. The second question, obviously, is you have this whole image which is very redundant, and you'd like to understand within this image what are the necessary coefficients that you really need to keep in order to reconstruct. And that's where comes the wavelet orthogonal basis. Basically, they correspond to a sampling of this image. We'll only keep scales which are powers of two. And for any scale, the wavelet is going to be translated by the scale, in other words, two to a j. So we're going to keep much fewer coefficients. So let me begin by this idea of sampling scale. That's relating this questions again to a whole research program and this idea of frequency channel. Suppose you only look at a scale 2 to a j, so now you are only going to look at wavelets which have this specific scale. As you move in space, you are looking at the correlation of your function with your wavelet translated. This can be viewed as an inner product, but it can also be viewed as a convolution operators, taking the different value at different points. Now, if you compute the Fourier transform of a convolution, this is going to be a product in the Fourier domain, the Fourier transform diagonalized convolutions. In other words, the Fourier transform of these coefficients, they are just obtained by taking the Fourier transform of f and multiply it by the Fourier transform of the wavelet, which is a dilation. So what are we doing? We are taking this Fourier transform and we are filtering it in different frequency channels covered by the different wavelets which are dilated. These are the Fourier transform of the wavelets dilated. So we see appearing this idea of filtering. Now this idea is again not new. It comes back to the whole work of Littlewood Pele in the 1930s. Now what Littlewood Pele thought in order to understand how to transfer property of operators from L2 to LP is precisely to do that. Take the Fourier transform, not look at individual Fourier coefficient, but filter these Fourier coefficient in dilated frequency bands. And what they showed is that if the wavelets have a Fourier transform which adds up to one, then you can reconstruct your function from the specific wavelet coefficient at the scale 2 to the j if you integrate all positions. So the solution of discretizing the wavelet transform like powers of 2 is an old solution, comes back to the 1930s. Now, we'd like to go beyond. We'd like also to sample time. Can we reduce this redundancy by eliminating that? And that's where will arrive to the wavelet orthogonal basis. Now again, the history of the subject goes back further in time. It was known that it was possible to have a function that you would dilate by factor of 2 to the j, and that you would translate, and which would define an orthogonal basis. That was the Haar basis. And the Haar basis is defined by a very simple wavelet function, which is equal to 1 between 0 and 1 half, and minus 1 between 1 half and 1. If you take these functions, you dilate them, either their support will not cover themselves so they will be orthogonal, or you can verify they will oscillate in a position where the other function is constant, so they are still orthogonal. So you can easily verify they define an orthogonal basis, and if you make a linear combination, you are building piecewise constant approximations of functions, and it will converge. So the problem is these functions are discontinuous. And when you have a function which is regular, you'd prefer decompose it over families of 
signals function which are themselves regular. But here there was a solution. Go to the other extreme. Look in the Fourier domain, and let's look at this idea of frequency channel. What if you take a wavelet, which is purely the indicator function of pi and 2 pi? Now, because of the Shannon theorem, you know that if you sample the result, you're going to get something which is orthogonal. So if you take this wavelet, you dilate it, you are going to cover all the frequency channels, which are all non-overlapping, so orthogonal, and you can same verify that you'd get an orthogonal basis. Now, what's the problem? The problem is these wavelets are discontinuous in the Fourier domain, so they have a very slow decay. So the question then is, can you find a function which is both regular and which has a fast decay and which defines an orthogonal basis of your signal space? And the answer is a priori no. No, because, you know, these things have been studied since 1909. So there is really, if it was possible, it would be known, basically. And it's that kind of wiseness that we all share, usually, but that Yves Meyer doesn't share. You've seen he's not a wise man. And so he tried, thinking probably it's not possible, but let's try. And what's the idea? The idea is, if you want to have a function which is regular, then the Fourier transform of this function has to be... Sorry, if you want a function which has a fast decay, then you need that this function should be regular in the Fourier domain. But the problem is, if the functions are regular in the Fourier domain, suddenly when you dilate them, they are going to overlap. And then the difficulty is to make them orthogonal. But then you have the trick of the Haar basis. And if you looked at the Haar basis, they are not centered in zero. They are centered in one half. In the Fourier domain, to center them in one half, that means introduce a phase. And if you introduce a phase, boom, you get an orthogonal basis if you construct it well so that the wavelet, when they intersect, they are symmetrical over their Fourier support. And that's how Yves Meyer proved that you can build functions which are synfinity, faster decay than any polynomial, and which define orthogonal basis. And that's one of these examples. And that was quite a revelation. Suddenly, there was a world that was broken. And immediately afterwards, the next question is, can you find other orthogonal basis than these ones? And to that question, it's Pierre-Gilles Lemarier who first realized that, yes, you can find other functions having even faster decay than Yves Meyer's wavelets, having an exponential decay. Now, let's look at an example. So the idea now that you have an orthogonal basis is that you can decompose your signal, your function, as a sum of these inner products, the correlation with wavelet coefficients, multiplied by the wavelets. So that's an example. Here you see a signal, and here you see the different scales. So you are going to do a correlation with wavelets having different width. The positive bars corresponds to large amplitude coefficient, positive, negative. And here you see there are many coefficients. You don't see them. There are thousands there, because they are very small. They are very small, and one of the questions is to understand that. How the amplitude of wavelet coefficient relates to the regularity of the function? That was the next important question before we come back to the construction of these wavelets. Now, how do you characterize the regularity of a function in mathematics. If you want to look at the pointwise regularity at a point, let's say, t0, one way is to look at how fast f of t is going to converge to f of t0 when t goes to t0. And if it converged like t minus t0 to a power alpha, you'll say that the function is Lipschitz alpha. So for example, if the function is here discontinuous, alpha equals to 0. If you have a singularity like here, sharp, that in that case is one-third, here you have a continuously differentiable function, alpha is big, going to be bigger than one, 
And here you have the realization of a Brownian motion. It's kind of fractal, and it's almost everywhere Lipschitz one half. Now, if you look at this property, now when you move away from t0 at a distance which is proportional to s, sorry, there is no t here, then the distance is going to be proportional to s to the power alpha. In other words, Lipschitz regularity is a scaling property. You look at the property of the function when you dilate it. And one way to do that is to do it with wavelengths. And there is this very beautiful results by Stéphane Jaffard and Yves Meyer that connected harmonic analysis to many, many applications by proving that if your function is Lipschitz alpha, then the amplitude of the wavelet coefficients are going to decay very fast to zero, like two to the j to the power alpha, when the scale goes to zero. And the remarkable aspect is the reverse. If you know this property, then you can characterize the pointwise regularity of the function at any points. It's almost an if and only if property. Now let me show you the consequence of that. If you take a function like the one I showed, if you are in a singular domain, if you look in the cone of influence where the wavelet feels this singularity, the wavelet amplitude, the decay, is going to characterize the singularity. Here it doesn't decay because the function is discontinuous. Here, the function is very regular, it decays very fast, and all coefficients, you can barely see them, they are close to zero. Here the decay is yet different than here, and at each point like that, you can characterize singularities, which is a fundamental element in many applications. The second very important consequence of that is that, as I said, most coefficients, whenever the function is regular, are going to be close to zero. And the consequence of that, that will be expanded by Emmanuel Condes, is the concept of sparse approximation. In fact, you can keep a very small proportion of wavelet coefficients above a certain threshold and reconstruct a very precise approximation of your function. Now, observe, this is a totally nonlinear approximation because you are going to select the coefficients based on their amplitude, and for two different functions, you'll select two different set of coefficients. The point is, by this simple thresholding, you are building an adaptive grid. You are putting a lot of coefficients near singularities because you need to precisely describe the shape of the function. But in the regions where there is a very regular function, you'll keep very few coefficients. And you do that just with a simple thresholding on the coefficient. And in that case, this function was reconstructed with less than 10% of the functions of the coefficient that was needed to specify the original signal. Now, let me come back to construction of wavelets. At the time I was working on my own PhD uh, in University of Pennsylvania, and very fascinated, I was very fascinated by perception and potentially the underlying mathematics. And there were key ideas that have been developed in the 80s in computer vision, in physiology, psychophysics of perception, was the importance of scale. David Marr was explaining that from a psychophysics point of view, there is a lot of evidence that the human visual system is analyzing images at different scales. From an engineering point of view, it's also quite obvious because instead of working with the image as a whole, which represents millions of coefficients, why not beginning to work with much lower resolution image out of which you can still recognize that you have a woman looking at you and then progressively increase the scale. That was the point of view of Peter Bird. Now, how can you go like this across scale? Well, you take your image and the pyramid algorithm of Peter Bird consisted in taking the image, making a local average, in other words, a convolution, and keeping one sample out of two. So you now have an image which is twice smaller. And then that's the averaging, one sample out of two. And then you repeat, same operation. You average locally with a convolution, one sample out of two, and so on. And that's how you build this pyramid. 
And the question then was, what's the underlying mathematics behind all that? Now, I had the luck to get the very beautiful paper of Yves Meyer creating these orthogonal bases, and I had a second luck, which was that there was no proof in the paper. So I had to try to do the proof, but having as an intuition these elements. And one way to think of these wavelet orthogonal bases, which in fact was also a path that Yves Meyer had been following, is by thinking that you are approximating functions at different resolution. And how do you approximate function at different resolution? By projecting them into spaces of progressively smaller, smaller, and smaller sizes as you lower the resolution. At low resolution, you basically have an approximation of your, say, image on a very coarse grid. And as you increase the resolution, it's as if you were refining the grid. So the projection on these spaces corresponds to multi-grid approximation, as it's also used in numerical PDs. And I thought about that, sent a manuscript to Yves Meyer with proofs that I couldn't complete, and that's very characteristic of the attitude of Yves. Enthusiasm, fantastic, why don't you come? We absolutely need to meet. And that's where we met in uh, Chicago, three days, and in three days, all the proof were resolved because Yves had also been thinking of that on his own way, and that's led to the creation of multi-resolution analysis. So multi-resolution analysis is this idea that you approximate function at different resolution by projecting them into different spaces which are progressively lowering the resolution. Now what's the relation with wavelets? The relation with wavelets is that how do you go from a low resolution image, which is a projection in a smaller space, to a high resolution image, which is a projection in a bigger space? Well, you look at the details that you've lost. What are the details that you've lost? The projection in the orthogonal space, Wj. So if you add up both, you are going to reconstruct the high-resolution image. So the first element is to realize, because these spaces are invariant to translation, you can build an orthogonal basis of these spaces with a single function that you translate. These were called the scaling functions. But now, if you look at the detailed space that does the complement, there must also be a basis of this space, and that's where the wavelet comes in. With a single wavelet, you translate it, you get a basis of your detailed space. Now, because when you pile up all the detailed spaces, you can recover any space of approximation, which itself is going to converge to your whole L2 space, you derive that you you pile up all these wavelets, all these details at different scale, you get an orthogonal basis. Now, if you think about that, what's happening? What you've been doing is you took a projection at the given resolution and you split it in two parts, the lower resolution part and the higher resolution part, or the details. And of course, you can recombine them to reconstruct the high resolution image. Now, this high-resolution image is characterized by its coordinates. The coordinates are the coefficients in an orthogonal basis. So that means that the coefficient in this basis can be split into two sets of coefficients, the ones that define the basis of this function and the wavelets, which defines the details that you can recombine. Now, there is something important. These spaces are obtained by dilation, but they are also translation invariant. When you have an operator which is linear and translation invariant, you know it can be written as a convolution. That meant that this scheme should be described with simple convolution with filters, H and G, subsampling, and you should reconstruct. But as always I've observed in mathematics, very often mathematicians are not the first one. Usually, I've observed the engineer had the idea much before. And that was yet another example. This had been discovered much before, but from a different point of view, in signal processing. And these are well-known 
in that field, conjugate mirror filters. So the idea of people in signal processing was to say, well, look, if you have a discrete signal, you'd like to split it into several discrete signals to do multiplexing, take several discrete signals, put them together, and have the same thing. And how do you do it? Well, you first separate the low frequencies with a filter H, you subsample, the high frequency with a filter G, you subsamples, so you have as much uh, sample here than here. And then the question is, can you reconstruct? By doing the adjoint operator, you insert zeros and a convolution and you sum. That was a question that was raised in the 70s by Estelan Galland. And then there was hundreds of paper in signal processing to solve that. And what people realize is that, in fact, there is a necessary and sufficient condition on this filter is simply that the Fourier transform of age, if you square it at pi, that should be constant. With this simple condition, you can find another filter G with just a translation and solve that problem. So that had many applications. Now, what's the relation with what I described? The relation is, it's exactly what the wavelet transform is doing. As I mentioned, you take a signal, how are you going to get the wavelet coefficient with a convolution with a filter? The low part, like in Peter Burt's algorithm, you are going to average it. And if you iterate, you are going to get the next scale wavelet coefficient, which amounts to split again the low frequencies and the average. And the average, you can split it again, like in the little wood pellet decomposition. You are going to get the wavelet coefficient and the average. Now, suppose you have n coefficient here. You are going here to have n over 2 coefficients, n over 4, and n over 2 to the j after 2 to the j element. Now, the number of operations to compute each of these set of coefficients is constant, so you can verify you have an algorithm which is O of n. That means that you can compute the decomposition of a signal in a wavelet basis with an algorithm which is faster even than the fast Fourier transform which takes n log n algorithm. Now, what about reconstructing? Well, you do like the signal processes we're doing. You use the joint filter. That's like recombining the low resolution approximation with the detail which gives you the next resolution. And then you incorporate the wavelet coefficients, you go to the next resolution, and so on, you reconstruct your signal. If you count the number of operations, it's still going to be n log n. So that shows suddenly that these wavelets, the key elements that were be, be, below, are these filters that were developed by signal processors, and I was in a department of signal processing, so it was the tool that was there. Cascading this filter leads to wavelet orthogonal basis. In other words, a wavelet, because a convolution is a product, can be written simply if you have one of these conjugate mirror filter as a product of these conjugate mirror filters, these low frequency filters, multiplied by this bandpass filter. So if you have H, and it's not very difficult, then you get a wavelet orthogonal basis. Now then the next question is, what are the good wavelet orthogonal bases? At the time, I thought, well, signal processors have been studying that for the last 10 years, so they should know. Ingrid thought that probably mathematics can bring a lot to that. And she was absolutely right. Why? Because the key point is not to understand the property of the filters, but to understand the property of the cascade of the wavelet. And that's how she created these beautiful wavelet orthogonal bases, which have a small support. And as you increase the regularity, the, sorry, the support of the wavelet, you can get wavelets which are progressively wider and wider support. And these wavelets have been used all over applications. Now, there's another element that Yves Meyer brought in his work, is how do you extend these wavelets to any dimension? in particular to images. And for images, there is a very simple way to do it in two dimensions. You take the wavelet basis that you used for one dimensional signal, and you make separable product of these scaling function and wavelet, 
And in two dimensions, you will need three wavelengths. And I'm now going to illustrate that over images. How do you build wavelet orthogonal basis of images with several wavelets dilated, translated? And the idea is the following. You have an image, and you can look at this image in the Fourier domain. It will cover a certain frequency domain. Now, you can redo exactly what we did in one dimension. First, along the rows of the image that you may consider as one-dimensional sequences, you will split them into the low and the high frequency. And then along the columns of the images that you are going to split along these low and high frequencies. And you get these two-dimensional wavelet bases that were introduced by Yves Meyer. Now look at these images. What is it? This corresponds to the wavelet coefficient in the direction one that are extracting the horizontal edges. Black point corresponds to large amplitude coefficient, negative, white, positive, and gray corresponds to zeros. Vertical edges, and you may see here corners. What did we do? We split the Fourier support in different channels. This first channel, corresponding to this image, second channel, and the third channel corresponding to corners. And then you just repeat. You split again your frequency domain by introducing the new wavelet coefficients. You split again, split again, and you get all these frequency channels defining these coefficients. Edges, horizontal, vertical, that's what these wavelet detect. Now, if you take a more complex image, the remarkable thing is that you see the same kind of thing. Almost all coefficients are gray, so nearly zeros. Few coefficients are big, positive, negative. That's where something is changing. And these are the wavelet coefficients which will allow us to define the singularities and to characterize the different edges of these images. But there are very few of them if there are few, few edges. And that's where image compression comes in. Suppose you have an image. An image, again, is an array of points. Each point is the gray level, 0 black, 255 is white, so it can be coded on 8 bits. If you think of that a bit naively, you may think, well, to compress it, you need to reduce the number of bits, and this is one bit, only black, only white. Now, if you compute the wavelet coefficient, and as I said, you just keep the largest one, so you build this adaptive grid, and you approximate the value of these wavelet coefficients, you get this image that was compressed by a factor of 40. And there was a large amount of work by signal processes engineers to define this JPEG 2000 compression standard, which is based on these wavelet orthogonal bases. And there is a lot of mathematics behind that Emmanuel Condes will be speaking about. Now let me finish on perception because that was mentioned by Eve, and that's a very fascinating topic. I spoke about music. If you think as a music, as a signal that is entering your ear, inside the ear there is a small organ which is called the cochlea, which is rounded like that. Now if you unroll the cochlea, you have cells, hair cells. And what are these hair cells doing? Well, that was analyzed in full detail in the 60s, 70s. These hair cells behave in a first approximation like linear filters. What kind of filters? Wavelets. These hair cells are filtering the input signals within different frequency bands which are dilated. Think of these wavelets as musical nodes. Here, you need a good frequency resolution within each frequency octave, typically about 24 in order to be sensitive even to half-tone sounds in music. And so the wavelets are very narrow in frequency, but still dilated. Question, why are these wavelets there? What is interesting is that if you look to vision, so as you know, vision is taking a very large part of our brain, about 30% of the brain, the eyes are here, and the back of the brain, you have the visual cortex, in particular V1. Now, in the 60s, 70s, so again, that gets back quite a long time, Eubel and Wiesel discovered that within the brain, you have 
cells, which are called simple cells, and they filter the input image which is transmitted through the optical nerve with filters. These filters are dilated, but because we are having images, you are going to have filters with different orientation which are symbolized here. I didn't draw that. This was a photocopy out of a book in physiology. And these filters are organized in hypercolumns, and you see appearing again wavelets. So one question is why wavelets will be there for perception. Now, for a long time, we've been thinking that was probably because of compression. We've seen wavelets are very useful for compression, so that's probably the, the use. But on the other hand, the brain is not there to compress signal. The brain, in particular visual brain, is here to interpret images. And I'd like to finish with a very open and interesting mathematical problem related to what's happening nowadays in big data and image recognition. So what's the problem of image recognition? You have images, and you want to recognize what is this image. And in order to do that, you have examples. You have families of images, and for each family of image, you know the label. So what you want to discover is this function of an image, a functional, which associates to the image the label. And in these examples, for example, here you have anchors, Joshua trees, beavers, and so on. Given this training set, you are now given a new image, and you would like to compute the label. Is it an anchor? Is it a lotus? Whatever. In other words, the problem is to approximate not a function of one, two variable, but a functional of millions or billions of variables. Now, computer vision essentially didn't work very well until 2010. And in 2010, we suddenly saw very impressive results coming out of an old field, which are neural networks, and in particular, thanks to the work of Yann Lequin. These results are based on the following idea. You're doing something very strange here. You're taking the image, and we're doing it, going to do something very similar to the fast wavelet transform, make filtering of these images with small filters, then subsample, but we are going to add here a nonlinearity. Take the absolute value of these coefficients. That's going to build a whole series of image, and then you're going to repeat. Take each of these images, filter it with small filters, subsample, take the absolute value, cascade that, and on the last layer, you just do a simple linear combination, and you hope to get an approximation of your incredibly complex functional. Now, the difference with all what I've told you is that you are not going to put by hand the filters. You are going to learn the coefficients of these filters. How? By saying, well, if I put in an example that I know, the output should be the label that I'm expecting or the real value that I'm expecting. So you're going to learn the filter in order to minimize the error. Now, when you do that, the surprising thing is that what you are learning in the first layers are essentially wavelets. And if you look at what's happening, the depths of these networks are really scaled, because what are you doing? You are aggregating progressively more and more and more information, exactly like in this fast wavelet transform algorithm. However, here you're getting absolutely remarkable results for image recognition, state-of-the-art results, but also to recognize speech, to recognize languages, to analyze medical data. The world champion in Go was beaten by such a machine to learn quantum physics. So that means that there is something very generic that is behind that you have a structure which is able to approximate functionals in high dimension. And the question, obviously, is why is that the case? What kind of classes of function can be learned? Because we know that not any functional can be learned that way. How come they can learn functionals that correspond to problems in perception or many problems that we are dealing with? The interesting aspect of this problem is that Yes, there are harmonic analysis aspects because you see appearing these multi-scale filters behind, but you have other branches of mathematics coming in. Because in high dimension, what is very important is to capture the symmetry of the functions. In other words, 
you have group theory comes in, coming in. And what looks like is that these machines are able to discover the symmetries of the problem and to build, in some sense, multi-scale representations of these groups. And by building that, they extract invariants that are able to characterize the functions that you get there. The results are really outstanding. So for example, one of the first competitions was ImageNet, where you have a million Im images, thousand classes, and these deep networks here can recognize, for example, that here you have a dog and cherries, that you have a beach wagon or a grid, a Madagascar cat, and so on, to the point that such algorithms can be even more precise than human to recognize faces, to recognize uh, specific classes of images. But as I said, also to regress and compute, for example, energies of uh, molecules, quantum energies of molecules, without knowing in advance uh, quantum physics. Now, there is one good news about that, is that these machines are not good to learn mathematics. In fact, we observe they even have a hard time to multiply numbers. They can recognize images, they can play Go, but hard time to multiply numbers. And that, I would say, is a very good news because Go now has a world champion, which is a machine, but that means that probably next year, Abel Price will not be a deep network, at least I hope it will not be. Thanks very much, and I'd like again to thank Steve New York. <laughs>